Good evening, friends, and welcome to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. It's lovely having historic clocks in the building, the Isaiah Lucans, to tell us when the hour chimes so that we can start. It is delightful to have you all here this evening. I'm Beth Hessel, the executive director of the Athenaeum of Philadelphia, and we are delighted to be sharing this event tonight with the Alliance Francaise, uh, with uh, um, to celebrate some uh, beloved members of our community. And uh, Nancy Gable, who is the immediate past president, will uh, is shortly be introducing our two speakers. If you are a, have never visited the Athenaeum before, please raise your hand. A few of you. If you are a, a member of the Athenaeum, please raise your hand. Even more of you, I love that. Take a look around. If you've never been here, look at people who had their hands raised and, and corner them afterwards and ask them what makes this place so special. And I think you will get a whole earful. We are a community that has been here in Philadelphia since 1814, celebrating and nurturing intellectual curiosity through the arts and literature, our built environment, language and books and conversation. And, and, and just as the Alliance Francaise is a community of people who love to get together to talk and learn, so do we at the Athenaeum. If you enjoy this evening and want to learn more, we invite you to talk to any one of our members or any one of our staff and uh, go online and find out more and, and please join us. Uh, we'd love to have you as part of our membership. Tonight is an example of what makes us so special because the Athenaeum has several literary awards that we give out every year. And one of them is a literary award for books that are written by authors who are in Philadelphia or about Philadelphia. The other one is a literary award for, for books on art and architecture written, again, by authors who live in or near Philadelphia. And uh, Lynn Mer Miller and Terry Dolan won it for the 2020 award. We provided, gave them that award at our annual meeting, which was virtual in April, and promised them that this fall we would have a big celebration. Our hope was that we'd be here toasting with champagne and enjoying some wonderful hors d'oeuvres. We don't have that, but we're here with full hearts and minds that are open and excited to hear and learn from them. And so we are glad that all of you are here to celebrate with us and with Lynn and Terry for their many wonderful accomplishments. Now, this evening, I want to thank you at this moment for keeping your masks on during the program. Um, although we have all shown our vaccination cards, we know that there is still transmission happening in our community and we want to keep everybody safe. I will be putting my mask on again as soon as I am done up here. Um, after the program, we invite you to stay and talk with one another because it is what is in our hearts and not that wine glass at the reception that brings us together. So take time to talk. I will be ushering Lynn and Terry to the back afterwards to sign copies of their book. If you brought a copy to be signed, that is wonderful. If not, and the holidays are approaching, you have someone you love, you want to give this wonderful book to. Carly from Head House Books is in the back to, for where you can purchase copies. But now, I'd like to introduce and invite Nancy Gable, who is the immediate past president of the Alliance Francaise, to come up and introduce our special guest. Thank you, Nancy. Maybe I'm just going to stop here. Yes. Okay. okay. This is such a wonderful occasion. We have waited so long to see Lynn and Terry do this presentation. And let me tell you, as somebody who is very aware of the progress of this book and who has read it, with a pencil underlining everything, I think you're in for a major, major treat. You all probably know about Lynn and Terry, two of the most outstanding scholars in the Philadelphia area, but the combination of history and art is just a winner. Um, 
I'm going, I, you didn't come to hear me, you came to hear them. But I just want to say how thrilled, on behalf of the Alliance, how thrilled we were when Lynn and Terry dedicated the book to the Alliance. We're also very thrilled that both Lynn and Terry were on and are still on the board for so long. Lynn, of course, was our past vice president. Terry has been a long-term board member. And how appropriate that a book of this caliber be presented in a venue like this. So Lynn and Terry, regale us. Well, good evening, and thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Athenaeum. Thank you, Alliance Francaise, for all you've done to make this evening possible. We are, of course, not going to talk about everything in the book tonight, so uh, be relieved. Um, essentially, there's, there's a chapter in the book, a bit more than a chapter, but largely one chapter, that deals with our topic tonight, which is the art and architecture of the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. Uh, let's see if I can just get started here. You recognize that building, I imagine. I'm going to read partly from the text because it gets to the point more readily than if I were to try to improvise. Creation of the Benjamin Franklin Parkway in the first decades of the 20th century brought into being a district influenced by a French aesthetic carried out by French architects. It uh, marked the culmination of a period of Gallic architectural and arch artistic influence that transformed Philadelphia's landscape. Fittingly, over the course of the past century, the next century, I should say, the Parkway gave rise to institutions holding many of the great masterpieces of modern French art while serving as a model of urban planning, French-trained Americans uh, often created much of the sculpture that is visible in the Parkway District today. Philadelphia became an industrial powerhouse in the aftermath of the Civil War, and its population soared from about 674,000 in 1870 to more than a million two decades later. The city's dynamism was symbolized in the construction of this vast new municipal building we know as City Hall, built, of course, on William Penn's center square. It was the largest and tallest all masonry building anywhere in the world when it was completed. It still has the uh, distinction of being the largest habitable such structure in the world. I don't know that people inhabit it actually, but perhaps some have over the, all these years. Uh, but during its long birth, it, it took 26 years to get it built, its height was surpassed slightly by the Washington Monument in the nation's capital, and then considerably by the Eiffel Tower in Paris. But of course, the latter is made entirely out of iron and not stone. City Hall is still the largest municipal building in the nation, larger, believe it or not, than the United States Capitol. It's more than 600 rooms cover more than 14 and a half acres of floor space. City Hall is thoroughly French in style. Its sweeping mansard roofs and rectangular uh, components reflect a heritage that stems from the Renaissance architecture of the Louvre, while its soaring tower, paired neoclassical columns, statuary, swags, and other ornaments from various architectural periods borrowed directly from that style's revival in the Second Empire. It was Baron Osman's wholesale remaking of Paris uh, at the direction of Napoleon III that it identified the style with a new urban ethic. French Renaissance revival architecture soon dominated uh, the look of many public buildings throughout America during the latter decades of the 19th century, but Philadelphia's City Hall has remained perhaps the grandest icon of them all, sprawling over four and a half acres and the most central block in the city. It, of course, was decorated with a sculpture of Alexander Milne Calder, 
whose 37-foot bronze statue of William Penn looks out on the city he founded from the very top of the building's tower. Still, even though there are some other buildings that are taller than City Hall today around Philadelphia, it retains pride of place at the center. By the time City Hall was under construction, Osman's creation of broad straight boulevards connecting landmarks looked to some Philadelphians as a stunning way to bring light and greater order to the city's cramped and crowded streets as well. A growing issue was how better to connect the city's park to its commercial center. The creation and gradual enlargement of Fairmount Park earlier in the century had provided a large amount of open space as an amenity for all Philadelphians. By the 1870s, the park extended for some 300 acres along the Schuylkill from the, west, uh, the waterworks at Fairmount and up the Wissahickon. Although it spread for miles from its starting point, where it faced the city, it remained largely hemmed in and enclosed by the grid of city streets. In the 1870s, a city engineer for Fairmount Park was first to propose a, that a, a diagonal road or roads might be superimposed over the grid with one or more of them leading from Broad Street to the park. And it was with that in mind uh, that others began to take up the cause. City Hall, once the uh, City Hall was nearing completion, it became more and more evident to those in, interested in this project that the boulevard should continue from Center Square to the south end of the park. The initial plan uh, was brought to, into being in 1891 in a bill uh, before city councils. However, it failed to bear fruit, thanks in part to the financial panic of 1893, uh, which prompted the mayor to veto parkway legislation. However, in that same year, Chicago's Columbian Exposition uh, showed a mass audience the uh, benefits of the kind of project that Osman had first shown us in Paris and that was already being considered for Philadelphia. The exhibition's aesthetic was largely that of the long dominant Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris uh, which promoted highly decorated neoclassical structures surrounded by open and balanced spaces to encourage a harmonious social order. This is the dawn of the City Beautiful movement, as it was known in America, and that grew as the American version of the French Beaux-Arts architectural tradition. The Americanized vision actually would endure into the 20th century, past the time that it was beginning to die out in Europe. In 1907, a new mayor, John Rayburn, took office and made construction of the parkway the priority of his administration. His trump card was the promise he received from one of the richest members of the city's elite, Peter A.B. Widener, to pay for the construction of a new art museum on condition that it be built on the summit of Fairmount. That also settled the question of the gateway's terminus. It would proceed on a straight line from City Hall through Logan Square to the foot of Fairmount. Yet another architectural plan was soon commissioned. Enter Paul Philippe Cré. This native of Lyon, France, attended that city's Ecole des Beaux-Arts before moving to Paris where he studied in the atelier of one of the leading practitioners of the Beaux-Arts uh, style, Jean-Louis Pascal. Already well known for uh, his work at age 27, Cray was recruited to join the Faculty of Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. And in 1903, uh, having been recruited largely to bring his Beaux-Arts uh, sensibility to Philadelphia. By 1907, when the new plan for a parkway was completed with Cray as one of its creators, he prepared a bird's eye view of the plan for a parkway. You can now see that, in fact, in this model, which is a photograph of which is inside City Hall. I believe there's also one in Dilworth Park. Uh, his plan shows, it scarcely shows in this photograph, at the far end of the parkway, a domed art museum atop Fairmount, and that is in classical mode. He also placed new public buildings all around the Great Plaza, which he had uh, 
petition, uh, had positioned at the foot of Fairmount. That would be the grandest plaza along the parkway in his original view. In 1908, voters approved a $1 million loan to move the project forward. Further delay, delays would follow, largely as a result of the conflicts between the Republican machine and would-be reformers. When the latter controlled the mayor's office, they were unable, of course, to obtain the needed uh, appropriations from the two city councils, dominated as the councils were by the party machine from which political patronage flowed. Meanwhile, World War I broke out in Europe in 1914. Paul Cray, though long a Philadelphia resident, happened to be back in France at the time. At age 38, he enlisted in the French army, in which he served to the end of the war in 1919. So he was out of the picture in Philadelphia during that, that period. The U United States only entered the war in April of 1917. The Parkway project was uh, evolving, therefore, without the participation of Paul Cray, its leading engineer. By 1916, a new machine favored mayor in City Hall, pushed demolitions of the building in the pathway, and so the actual construction of the parkway was well underway. It was also determined by then that the parkway, once completed, would be put under the administration of the city's park system, that is, the Fairmount Park Commission. Uh, since the parks were governed by an independent commission, it meant that they had the right to control construction within 200 feet of the proposed boulevard. Given that change, the commission soon drafted and uh, land use regulations that differed from those for the city. That, in turn, called for some revision in Cray's original plan. The landscape architect chosen to make those changes was once again a native of France, Jacques Grébert. Great, like Cray, a graduate of Paris's École des Beaux-Arts, Graybear was then in the process of creating a stunning interpretation of a French classical garden at a private estate outside Philadelphia. The property in suburban Elkins Park was that of Edward Stotesbury, president of the Fairmount Park Commission, who, of course, recommended Graybear for the new parkway assignment. Graybear had recently completed another lavish garden for Stotesbury's, Stotesbury's late friend, the same P.A.B. Uh, uh, Widener, whose offer to build, to pay for the building of an art museum on the summit of Fairmount had come and gone with his death. Once he was appointed, Gray Bear prepared a set of drawings modifying the 1907 plan. They remained very faithful to Cray's original vision, but with some uh, definite changes. He, because now the parkway was to be under the jurisdiction of the park system, he drew up the park on down from Fairmount all the way to Logan Circle, replacing what had expected what what Cray had expected would be uh, lined with um, massive public buildings, and that meant he moved the reference to the Place de la Concorde from the foot of, of Fairmount down to our own Logan Square, which of course already existed. That's the halfway point along the new boulevard. And in Grey Bear's plan, the uh, square just below the summit of Fairmount would be turned into a, a smaller oval or a circle. At last, the long effort to build a parkway was in sight. By the end of 1918, work uh, on the boulevard was largely completed. After he heard repeated comments on the parkway's resemblance to Parisian counterparts, Grébert showed France's gratitude for the American war effort when he said this in a letter to a Philadelphian. If by this work the city of Paris may be enabled to bring its sister in America the inspiration of what makes Paris so attractive to visitors, it will be the first opportunity of Paris to pay a little of the great debt of thankfulness what Philadelphia and its citizens have done for France during the last three years. That's a view I'm sure you've, you've seen before and will see many times again. Although Paul Cray, still in France, was unhappy with the reports that he got, that he got about his, how his plans for the parkway had been changed, he was rather quickly reassured by his friends in Philadelphia that the original conception remained largely intact. Once Cray returned to Philadelphia, Gray Bear, who was several years younger than he, uh, worked assiduously to cultivate the older man's favor. As a result, in the 1920s, the two collaborated on the design for 
a, a new museum to nestle among the trees on the Upper Parkway. The Rodin Museum, which opened in 1929, uh, came about because of a bequest from a local philanthropist and theater magnate, Jules Mastbaum, who owned the largest chain of movie theaters in the world, having begun with a Nickelodeon at 8th and Market Streets in Philadelphia. By the 1920s, he'd also built several of the largest and most glamorous movie palaces in his native city. In 1926, he approached Grébert to design a museum for his remarkable collection of the works of Auguste Rodin, uh, some of whose sculptures he'd been exhibiting in his movie theaters. Then, uh, soon after Grébert was engaged, Mastbaum died unexpectedly, leaving Philadelphia nearly 150 sculptures and casts of works by Rodin, one of the largest such collections outside Paris. Meanwhile, Grébert asked Cray to join him in designing the museum. Grébert insisted when the museum opened that the building was largely the work of Cray, whereas he, Grébert, had done the garden. Visitors agreed that the parkway entrance to the brooding bronze the thinker before the facade of the classical Moudon Gate, named to refer to Rodin's burial place at his villa in Moudon, Ile de France, just outside Paris. Two niches in the wall hold Rodin pieces. Beyond the gate lies the formal garden where gravel paths diverge past a reflecting pool and flower beds to a raised terrace and the, uh, the uh, museum itself. The bronze casting of the gates of hell on the doorway of the museum was the first ever done from the artist's plaster cast of the work and was installed here at the museum's opening in 1929. Uh, large sculptural groupings flanked the building to the rear of the garden. Even though the grandest visions of Cray and Grébert uh, were not fulfilled during their lifetimes, uh, it's continued to guide, their, their ambitions have continued to guide plans for the parkway to the present, and I would suggest probably will continue to do so into the future. Between 1927 and 41, Philadelphia's tribute to the Place de la Concorde as well emerged from construction of two new buildings on the square's north side. On the left here, you see the two buildings I refer to on Logan's circle. On the right, there are uh, models, the models for those buildings at the Place de la Concorde, Place de la Concorde in Paris. Uh, the central features of the Place de la Concorde are its two monumental fountains flanking an Egyptian obelisk, all of which were installed there between 1826, 1836 and 1840 during the reign of King Louis-Philippe. At Logan Square, the 1907 design by Cray and his associates had also placed an obelisk at the center, but that totem disappeared in Graeber's reworking of the plan, leaving a single monumental fountain in its place. The Fountain of the Three Rivers, better known as the Swan Fountain to most Philadelphians, uh, of course, is a tribute to the three rivers of Philadelphia, uh, the Delaware, the Schuylkill, and the Wissahickon. The creator of the Swan Fountain, Alexander Sterling Calder, was of course the son of Alexander Milne Calder, the man who had done all the sculpture on City Hall. He also was trained at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris, and uh, other of his works are in the city, particularly there on, on Logan Square. Uh, the third generation of Calders, of course, produced the man known better as Sandy Calder, also Alexander, who invented uh, the sculpture we know today as the Mobile. Uh, it was his sister in her biography of the family's three sculptors who argued that it was the experience of Paris at a crucial formative stage that put its stamp on the work of each of these people, each of these uh, Calders in each generation. There are still further resemblances between the Champs-Élysées and Philadelphia's Benjamin Franklin Parkway, as it was renamed in 1937. At the south uh, eastern terminus, City Hall, with its clear references to the Louvre, is the focal point much as is its counterpart in Paris. At the northwest end, northwestern end, not the Arc de Triomphe, but the neoclassical Philadelphia Museum of Art uh, is the terminal visual point. There it is. 
1965, the Philadelphia Museum of Art acquired Sandy Calder's huge white mobile, Ghost, which hangs since then uh, from the ceiling in the museum's great stair hall. From that vantage point, it's possible to look right down the Benjamin Franklin Parkway to take in both Alexander S uh, Sterling Calder's Swan Fountain at Logan Square and, and Milne Calder's statue of William Penn atop City Hall. So the local quip you may have heard acknowledges that the, this view takes in uh, the view of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. To the north of the Art Museum stands another reminder of the comparable district in Paris, a gilded equestrian statue of, you know her, as Joan of Arc, riding into battle, towers above the 25th Street intersection. This is an 1874 sculpture by Emmanuel Frémier, and it was installed at the eastern end of the Girard Avenue Bridge in 1890, then in 1948 was moved to its current location, facing the Fairmount Acropolis, and it was first gilded in 1959. A second of only three such castings stands outside the Louvre on the Rue de Rivoli in Paris, and the third is in Nancy, France. In 2012, I'm skipping some of our history here, the Philadelphia Museum of Art was joined on the parkway by the new headquarters of the Barnes Foundation, whose collection of 19th and early 20th century French art is perhaps the largest outside Paris. The original headquarters designed by Paul Cray and opened in the suburb of Lower Marion in 1925 features, in addition to the art that Albert Barnes had collected over many years, the cubist bas-reliefs commissioned from Jacques Lipschitz for the building's northern entrance. Cray himself designed the landscape frescoes in the style of Cezanne for art spaces in one gallery. The facility remains as the Barn Foundation School, the adjoining Cray-designed uh, Cray house is for Albert Barnes is, is now the administration building. The coming of the Barnes Foundation to the Parkway brought another world-class cultural institution to the boulevard that had always been intended as just such a focal point. Its move to the Parkway was contentious because, because of Albert Barnes' well-known dislike for the Philadelphia art establishment, but it was settled in court with the proviso that the new galleries, the galleries in the new building, had to exactly match those that were originally designed by Cray uh, in Marion. I'm going to leave it at that and turn the microphone over to Terry Dolan. Thank you very much for your attention. Lynn leaves me at a good place uh, because what I want to talk about is some of the art that is in these buildings and the important art that we are so fortunate to own here in Philadelphia. And let me see where I am, yeah, here we go. And so I want to talk about uh, major, the two major works I'll speak about tonight are Cezanne's, Paul Cezanne's Large Bathers, a post-impressionist work, and Henri Matisse's Joy of Life, which is at the Barnes Foundation, both of them on the parkway, and both of them major monuments that started the 20th century uh, history of art. Cezanne's Large Bathers is the largest of a series of bather paintings by him, and it's considered one of the major masterpieces of modern art, and is often considered Cezanne's really finest work. He had worked on it for seven years, and it remained unfinished at the time of his death in 1906. And the, the painting was purchased in 1937 for $110,000 with funds from a trust fund for the Philadelphia Museum of Art by their major benefactor, Joseph Widener. And it was previously owned, Widener bought it from Leo Stein, uh, the brother of Gert the poet Gertrude Stein. And Stein was a great collector of Renoirs and Cezannes, and uh, were, was very influential on Barnes, who has the largest collection of Renoirs and Cezannes in the world. 
Now, having attended drawing classes in Aix-en-Provence, Cezanne went to Paris for the first time in 1861 and spent long periods in the Louvre making drawings of paintings after the old, by the old masters. And this is a practice which he continued for the rest of his life. Now, bathing figures are largely um, found in approximately 200 of Cezanne's oil paintings, watercolors, lithographs, and drawings. There was a large show at the Basel Art Museum in Switzerland years ago. My husband and I were over there, and we went through, saw the sketches and the drawings and the watercolors. And we get to the last room, and there in black and white scale uh, size photographs was the Philadelphia Museum of Art Bathers and the Barnes Bathers. I said, well, let's just jet home and finish the show, you know, because there we were. Now, these paintings constitute Cezanne's personal interpretation of the long-established tradition of depicting female nudes in landscapes, which was a popular Renaissance um, subject by the great Venetian artists such as Giorgione here with his Sleeping Venus and Titian with his Diana and Callisto. Now, Cezanne obviously had great ambitions for his large bathers. We can tell by the size of it, uh, which is, relates to the grand depictions of historical and religious paintings, then constituting the most important category in the academic salon. Large paintings in the 19th century were known as machines. They usually covered, they were, you know, some of them covered, if you go to the Louvre, you can walk in front of paintings uh, and take several steps. I'm thinking of, of Cezanne's, um, of, I mean, of of, uh, you know, of works in the Louvre and in the, um, the, the Musée d'Orsay, the 19th century paintings by Delacroix and by Giraudet and others that are very large and imposing. And this is the Salon jury uh, had, the, the, if you wanted to exhibit, you usually had to exhibit at the Salon. The gallery system had not been instituted until the second half of the 19th century. And the Impressionist artists were tired of getting their works rejected. It was a very political aspect to getting your work accepted. You had to follow what the Academy style was. And if you deviated from that, your work could very easily be rejected. So what the Impressionists did, and you can see here the crowding of the pictures uh, that were shown at the Salon. If they didn't like your work, they could sky it. In other words, they'd hang it up real high. So if you have a little, you know, very beautiful little still life, nobody could really see it. Um, a wonderful book, I just my book club, we just read uh, Zola's Masterpiece, uh, which is a wonderful recounting of the time of the um, Impressionists and the, the Salon. So the Impressionists got uh, banded together and said, we don't want to exhibit at the Salon anymore. We're tired of getting our work rejected. So what they did was to rent a, a place in Nadar's photo studio on the Boulevard des Capucines, and they had a first Impressionist exhibition in 1874. And they could then hang their works all together. All the Monets could be hung together. All the Renoirs could be hung together. All the Morisseaux. So you could get an idea of their style without having them skied or compete with so many others. Now, the Cezanne was a post-impressionist, and he never exhibited with them. He wanted to, uh, he wanted really to, he, he really wanted to do his own thing and pull away from the academic salon. And so in working on the large bathers and trying to redo the old masters according to nature, which was one of his goals, what he did was to adapt the, the roughly triangular design and inward slanting trees. The triangle is your most stable form in nature. And that became the, uh, the form that many Renaissance artists look. If you look around, you can see the Mona Lisa. You can enclose her in a triangle because it's very stable. The same thing with Raphael's Madonna. When you go to the Baroque image, the Baroque, it turns it upside down because upside down triangle is the most unstable. So it's dynamic and exciting. Now, since the Renaissance, the human body was the primary vehicle for the expression of what was beautiful in art. 
And there was an academic hierarchy of subject matter where history painting and religious painting was at the top of the scale. And that meant subjects from classical literature, from the great literature of, of, of writers such as Voltaire, Racine, uh, Corneille, and um, Montaigne, any of the, the thing that you could get a subject out of. So, and then religious paintings. And that was the highest because painting was supposed to tell a story. It was entertainment for the eyes. And then after that was portraiture and then landscape and still life. And what Cezanne does, whenever I taught my 19th century art history class, I would start with the, the late 18th century. And by the 19th century, Cezanne ends. And what he does is to revolutionize paintings with the portrait, the landscape, and the still life, the three major uh, things. He really reverses that academic hierarchy of subject matter. But he, and then in the 19th century, and the 18th and 19th century, painters like Francois Boucher and Eugène de la Croix, they cast off the classical and biblical associations, try to, of the, the, uh, the bathing scene, and they wanted to present the body in a much more naturalistic way. This led uh, Edouard Manet to paint The Luncheon on the Grass, which became the major scandal of the Salon de Refusé in 1863. Uh, and uh, the, uh, there was a great uproar about this painting. In 1863, at the Salon, Manet's déjeuner was not accepted at the Salon, so it was shown in a separate venue. The paint, and it was dis dis seen as disgusting and uh, very erotic and improper. This is the one that won first prize. Okay, so there you go. You know, I call her Venus on the half shell. You know, there she is, tipped up for you to, you know, for the delectation. So this was what the standard of looking at the female body was. And of course, it's the birth of Venus. So that you can say, well, I'm studying my classical literature, you know, when of course, it, these, oh, these paintings were done really for the male viewer. The female viewer was really not very important. And then Manny, when he showed the Olympia at the Salon of 1865, the Salon decided to accept it because they thought, we have to teach him a lesson. And there's going to be so much uproar over this, and there was. They had to actually move the painting because there were threats of having it destroyed. In 1883, for the centenary of Manet's death, uh, these paintings could not be moved from, the, uh, the, from, from France. They were too valuable, 100 years after his death, and had caused such a scandal. So it takes time for things to catch on. Now, the Impressionists either avoided the human figure or they represented it in modern or urban settings. Now, uh, Cezanne's bathers are the least natural of all of his subjects. And I'm showing you here another work that we have that is a very important work at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Renoir's large bathers, his beigneurs. And here they're just splashing in the water, and these charming creatures appear trivial and unimportant. They're not really uh, doing anything. Where is Whereas in Cezanne's work, there is a kind of austerity about them. They neither bathe nor play. They're not enjoying themselves in the landscape the way that others are. They're set in very constrained, self-isolating, thoughtful postures. They're, um, when, when you look at, at Renoir, these young figures are they're free from care. They're just sort of playing in the water. And they reveal their whole nature. On the other hand, Cezanne's bathers, who are sitting or standing or lying, they exist solely for the sake of their being about them, such as their faces. They're often absorbed into uh, another realm altogether. As you can see, he often he, you know, did not really finish these works and leaves it unfinished. He wanted to, one of his ambitions was to realize the ambition of posing nude figures out of doors. And when Zola wrote the masterpiece, he based it on the lives of Manet, Monet, and Cezanne, mostly Cezanne. Cezanne was his boyhood friend in Aix-en-Provence. They grew up together, they came to Paris together, and in 1886, when Zola sent the masterpiece, which was a, a, a bestseller, everybody knew who the figures were, to Cezanne, Cezanne never spoke to him again because he realized, because what happens is that the painter who's painting, trying to paint a figure out of doors is a failure. And in the end, he hangs himself in front of his work of art. So, you know, this was a, a, a great rift. 
But Cezanne had said he wanted to make something, Impressionism, an art as solid as that of the museums. He missed the kind of old master grandeur that he saw at the Louvre and in old master art. And he wanted to graft that onto uh, a different kind of art rather than having the fleeting impression of haystacks or cathedral facades or people sitting in cafes out of doors, which was the staple of the Impressionist subject matter. And so he often studied at the, 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 um, the Crouching Venus at the Louvre, and a sculpture, and, and you can see how he's adapted her to this. Now, one of the strangest parts, I mean, this is a really strange painting, and I want to point out the figure there on the right, um, the squatting or kneeling figure on the right, is read by analogy. And what you see here, I mean, this is almost very difficult. I, wanna, we don't, I don't have a pointer here, so I'm going to move carefully over there. body and he doesn't make it he doesn't make this fig his bathers beautiful so what he does is to deconstruct the and he erases the traditional discourse of the nude these may be, ba be bathers but they're not beauties they're no ba bathing beauties and as Roger Fry who um, invented the term post-impressionism wrote he said these are calculated to enrage our notions of feminine beauty so Cezanne had a very hard time getting started and, and uh, in his work. But what he does is to launch really 20th century art. He's known as the father of modernism. And you can see here in this detail of the sky that there are, uh, of the, what you see is just patches of color that don't belong or adhere to any kind of object. So Cezanne's art was a very strange novelty in its time. It lies between the old kind of picture, which is faithful to a striking or a beautiful object, and what he does is in many ways introduce abstraction, a modern abstract painting, which is a moving harmony of colored touches that don't represent anything. So these, these his bathers really anticipated by a few years this, the assertively sensual nudes in the early work of Picasso and Matisse, and certainly directly influenced them. Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon was very much an outgrowth of Picasso's understanding of Cezanne. Cezanne dies in 1906, there's a major retrospective, and Cezanne, uh, the, the artists of the time, really take after his work. The, the statement, Cezanne is the father of us all, has been attributed to both Picasso and to Matisse, who both claim themselves as the offspring, the progeny of Cezanne. And this Demoiselle d'Avignon is as crucial to the history of 20th century painting, as it really is the first painting to give monumental expression to a concept of pictorial space toward which experimental painters have been working for more than a century of drying up the pictorial space. Once photography comes up, why would you even do, you know, imitate something like that? So painting became about the act of the, the brush and the medium itself. And so what he did was to channel the breakdown of forms and what you have in Cezanne, in Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, is now a painting that is unburdened by any kind of imitation. And it leads us to the high point of abstract expressionism. Uh, Matisse also was very much influenced by Cezanne's bathers. And in his Joy of Life, which is at the Barnes Foundation, which I'm so glad now you can see it without having to go up the steps or you know, down the steps, it's got its own room. So you can really see this wonderful work. And also, when I began teaching Impressionist art, uh, you could not represent this in color. You could not teach Matisse in color. Why teach Matisse if you can't do color? I mean, Fauvism, what is Matisse about but, but color? So after Violette de Mazia died, that, art, that went out the window. Now, Matisse is a French artist who was known for his use of color and his very fluid and original draftsmanship. 
He's commonly regarded, along with Pablo Picasso and Marcel Duchamp, as one of the three artists who helped to define the revolutionary movements of the plastic arts in the opening decades of the 19th century. And we are so fortunate in Philadelphia, on our parkway, to have the major collections of Cezanne. We have a huge collection of Matisse and also of Duchamp, Marcel Duchamp. The major Duchamp collection is also in Philadelphia. Uh, my license plate is the title of one of his works. And you know, I've, I've never given a Duchamp lecture in the classroom. He's one of my favorite artists and is certainly the father of postmodernism and conceptual art. Now, the first sign of a specifically 20th century art movement appeared in Paris in 1905. The third autumn salon, there was a group of younger painters who were, again, independent of the French salon and the French academy. And, and under the direction of Matisse, they exhibited canvases with brilliant colors and very abstract kinds of drawing that startled critics. And just as Impressionism was coined in derision by Louis Leroy, uh, saying, oh, this painting by Monet is just an impression. Go home and finish it up. It's unfinished. And when the, uh, the critic Louis Vaucel saw the Matisse there, he, and he looked at a, a white sculpture that was in the gallery, he said, oh, c'est Donatello chez les fauves. It's Donatello among the wild beasts. And so this group of artists around Matisse, Durand, Vlaminck, and led by Matisse, became known as fo the Fauves. And Fauvism is really uh, the, the major. One teaches, in a sense, Matisse and Picasso at the beginning of the 20th century as the progenitors of what is to come. Now, the Fauves were encouraged by the newly discovered exotic uh, arts of Africa and Oceania that you, could see, that you saw in the Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon. And what is happening here is that imitation is no longer the primary thing to try to convince you of the realism of the work of art. What they did also was to free color from its traditional role as description. In other words, a tree no longer had to be green. It could be pink, it could be blue, it could be purple, it could be any color that the artist wanted because what he was doing was expressing what we've moved from is impressionism to expressionism. Now, in a sense, color really becomes the subject of the painting. And what Matisse shows here is a mythical paradise uh, that is inhabited by naked revelers. And what he wants to give us is the pure sensuality of color. And the only movement is in the long flowing curves of the trees and the very sinuous contours of the nude bodies. Now, these undulating rhythms in combination with the relaxed poses of the two reclining women at the center, establish the quality of serenity. This re what Matisse wanted to do was to show art that relieved you from the stress of modern life and that characterized his work from this point. This became the keynote of his future painting, which is why it has become such an important monument for 20th century work. And what it does is a, it's a pagan scene in the classical sense, in, uh, of, uh, it's a bacchanal, just like Titian's famous bacchanal. And the poses of all the figures have mostly a classical origin. Like Cezanne, he didn't want to give up the old masters, but he wanted to move art forward. And his draftsmanship really uh, uh, resides, he had a very profound notion of the human body. Matisse's art seems to flow. It always just seems so easy, like, you know, he just drew it and it came out. If you look at his sketches, you see the struggle until he finally achieved that aspect. And what makes the painting so revolutionary is its genius of omission, as one critic called it. What you see is that he doesn't have any of the shading in, of the, the bodies as you see in the Titian. You don't have the light and dark contrasts at all. You have just my, mere outline, the suggestion rather than description. But what holds the painting together is its underlying structure, and this is what he learned from Cezanne. He, was a, he, he venerated Cezanne and owned one of his paintings. He said, so painting is no longer the representation of reality. It's the rhythmic arrangement of colors and lines on a flat plane. That's what, that's what painting does. You just arrange certain planes of color on a flat plane. And so he monumentalizes feeling without eliminating it. And he preferred working in two dimensions by the, uh, and I'll go back to this, by, but, the, but the subject of his color accents, they convey the, the aspect of three-dimensional space. 
And you, what you see in the, again, the triangular shape there in the middle there, and underneath those are dancers. Now he said, um, he puts the matter of expression very succinctly. He said, what I, am after, what I am after above all is expression. I am unable to distinguish between the feeling I have for line and my way of expressing it. The whole arrangement of my picture is expressive. Everything plays a part. Composition is the art of arranging in a decorative manner the various elements at the painter's disposal for the expression of his feelings. All that is not used to the picture is detrimental. So all this is about is the inner feeling of the, of the artist himself. And so he lets the painting emerge out of almost deep unconscious feeling. Matisse intellectualizes painting, but his art really reflects a great love of color and joy. He wanted to, to seem like the being, he wanted painting to seem like sitting in a comfortable chair at the end of a day. He didn't want the stress of deep intellectual uh, work. Now, Picasso thought that uh, Picasso started his Demoiselle d'Avignon after that, and that was really a response to the Picasso Demoiselle d'Avignon, was a response to Matisse's joy of life, as well as to the Cezanne. Now, the dance is an essential work uh, by Barnes, uh, at the Barnes Foundation, when Barnes invited Matisse to view his foundation, that at that time held the largest collection of Matisse's in the world, the Cone Collection in Baltimore, and the Barnes has one of the, two of the major collections of Matisse paintings. And Mat Matisse had come to uh, Pennsylvania to judge the Carnegie Medal in New York. And he welcomed his, the opportunity to see the famed collection because Barnes didn't let people in. You know, he would allow a truck driver in, but if you were an artist or an art historian and all, that you couldn't get in. He was a very idiosyncratic person. Now, during the, uh, the visit, uh, Barnes negotiated with Matisse to decorate these three lunettes in the main gallery. And so the artist settled on the theme of the dance, which he had in, uh, investigated in his joy of life. And right above these, either the, the two paintings underneath these, are two Picassos. So what he's trying to do is to rival the Picassos, you know, like I'm going to be above you in both subject matter as well as in placement. The two of them were very much rivals with one another at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, what you have is the, the buoyant curves, and when he got there to install it, he realized he'd been given the wrong dimensions. So he, he had to go back to Nice and to do these all over. And, but the, and I like the second one. You can see the model for the first one, but the buoyant curves and the dramatically expressive lines that are in this dance inspired him to really embrace the architectural lines of the gallery, and the, the, beautiful, the way that it is placed is really wonderful. Uh, whereas, and he had to knew that he was being challenged by the Picassos that were there. And on the right of the, uh, if you've been in the building, if you're, you're looking there, on the right is, is a, a very, again, important painting by Seurat of the Great Bathers. So this is a room that is filled with very important masterpieces. So Matisse, when he did this in 1930, and these works were already there in Barnes's home, he knew what he was taking on as a kind of competition there. And he, when he completed his work and he traveled back to Marion to supervise the installation, he informed his son in a letter about his experience. He said, it has a splendor that one cannot imagine unless one sees it, because the whole ceiling and its arched vaults come alive through radiation, and the main effect continues right down to the floor. I'm profoundly, profoundly tired, but very pleased. When I saw the canvas put in place, it was detached from me and became part of the building. Now, this dance is not only one of Matisse's largest commissioned works, it also is a turning point in his career, because what it does is to introduce the wonderful cutout works that he did, uh, the paper forms that prefigure the decorative freedom of the 1940s, where many now see Matisse moving in directions that American artists would take decades to fully absorb. So I'm going to leave it at that, and Lynn and I are very happy to take any questions that you might have. And uh, further, de we've, we've done you know, things that are in the book, but not all of this is in the book. I was able to, there was so much more that one wanted to write that it could have been three tomes you know, by the end of it, but we had to stop it somewhere. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, Lynn and I would be very happy to answer them. Lynn will join me at the microphone. Sure, I
down to repair, yeah. Any questions for us? There's one. Ooh. No, I think that's the direction he was moving, you know, toward the simplification. I mean, he wanted the, the ease of that. Um, it's a kind of natural progression of where he was going uh, in his work. Yes, he was older. Yes, that's why he says he was tired, you know, but um, he wanted to, you know, he, when he saw this and saw the collection that Barnes had uh, of his work, and Barnes was one of his major patrons. I mean, Matisse made a lot of money off of Barnes. So he realized, you know, of course, at that point, the Barnes Foundation was closed. It was not open to the public. Barnes had a school uh, there. Uh, and at the school, he, the, uh, the, the people at the, the school had to, at the, uh, the, the workshop, had to, in his chemical factory, had to study art history, you know, as well, and, and literature and music. So he was always about education. And the Barnes Foundation was primarily not a museum, but an educational foundation. It was, yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Cezanne's Yes. I should say it was unfinished after seven years. Yes. Well, the, you know, the, he, Cezanne painted very slowly. You know, his matter of painting was very slow. He would put one, one stroke on and stand back and think about it. And you know, he, he, had, he had, on his deathbed, he said, I'm just learning, I'm just beginning to learn how to paint. You know, he really never felt that he had accomplished his masterpiece, which is what Zola wrote about in that novel, is that, you know, this, he just never, you know, he never saw his vision. So it, if you look at his, some of his earlier works and some of the works at the, at the Barnes, the finish would never be like, you know, the finish of academic paintings. But it would have, he would have filled in some of the, the other parts too. Yes. So as I said, there were over you know 200. There are over 200 bather uh, watercolors and paintings, but the, these are considered the major masterworks of his career. You know, one time when I was in Aix-en-Provence, I was I took a group of Temple uh, alums, and the you know we went to see Mont Saint Victoire. We visited uh, Cezanne's studio. We had sort of a Cezanne day, and the guide said, you know, we have a small museum, the Musée Musée Grenet, but we do not have one work by Cezanne here. He's buried in Aix-en-Provence. She said, and she said to the group, she said, if you really want to see the best Cezanne, you should go to Philadelphia. You know, so we said, yeah, we'll do that. You know, so as I said, I'm always so grateful that uh, you know here along the Parkway, we have such wonderful examples. Being a Francophile, uh, we have such wonderful examples of French art and architecture. Uh, I've learned a great deal from from Lynn uh, also in his history of architecture. Anybody else? The question was, is there still talk about a Calder Museum? Yes, I neglected to mention that just in the interest of time. Only weeks ago, there was an announcement that the, uh, the to, to create a Sandy Calder Museum is what well, I'm sure what you have in mind, is back in back on the on the drawing boards. It will be across from the Rodin on the opposite side of the boulevard. It's to be fairly small, both indoor and outdoor, a garden and I, I gather fairly small exhibition rooms inside. Good question. Yes. Uh, back to the Parkway, was there ever a moment in history where the planners envisioned recreating the spirit, not the form, but the spirit of the Shandy, the Flaneur, the Café? It was never seen that way. Uh, I'm just like, I'm not sure how to answer that question, which is an intriguing one. Um, it's, it seems very clear to me that both Cray and Bear certainly had the Champs-Élysées well in mind throughout the, the construction, and therefore so did people who associated with them. W whether anybody took it to what you suggest, the notion of sort of replicating the, the flaneur, et cetera, I don't know. Um, do, 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 any, do any of you see Flaneur along the uh, Benjamin Franklin Parkway? Maybe now and then. Uh, times have changed, too. I'm not sure you see Flaneur in the same sense on the Champs-Élysées either anymore. A Flaneur is a stroller. 
You know, yeah. it's, it's a person of leisure and wealth, yeah. actually, as a, as a character in the 19th century. Uh, the, the Barnes had a wonderful exhibit on the mm -hmm. flaneur, yeah. Yeah, show yourself off by yes. being having nothing to do, mm -hmm. but stroll along the boulevard. In your top hat and your cane, yeah. and yeah. There were female flaneurs, but the flaneurs... The There's a question one. over yes. here. Mm -hmm. Yes, Fred. Is there architectural uh, illustrations, residential or commercial, uh, that showed that the French influence was taking off in the city? I'm afraid I didn't quite understand that question, Fred. It, Well, I think it's the time when the parkway was being created, yes. I, don't uh, the I know you don't. The, um, as I tried to indicate in my remarks, the influence, the, the notion of a city beautiful coming out of, especially of the uh, Chicago uh, exhibition in 1893, sort of swept the country or swept the country in terms of those who were interested in such things architecturally. And yes, it had its it it made a mark in Philadelphia, but but I would argue that the uh, the construction of City Hall, which precedes that event by a couple of the beginning of the construction, does um, is also a mark of French influence, obviously, in in Philadelphia, and it was being replicated elsewhere in the country. So whether Philadelphia ended up looking more French than some other cities is maybe not for me to say, but but certainly it's it's as outstanding an example as you can think of any place in the country had enough i would just like to say that this book would not have happened if it were not for the alliance francaise we got a tremendous amount of emotional support and you know and some financial support from the alliance and that's why we dedicated the book to them so i want to thank Nancy Gable, as for she's our outgoing president, I want to thank the, the Alliance Francaise for this because it happened, the conception was Lynn's, and it happened after a board meeting at the elevator uh, at the Alliance Francaise, and this is the result of it, and the book is there for you to, to peruse. So thank you very much for coming. Yes. Yes. I'll, take, I'll take my turn. Yeah, yeah. I'll take my turn. Yeah. There we go. I want to thank everybody for coming. I will be ushering Lynn and Terry down to the back. So those of you who are seated there, if you could move there so they can sit. And please don't rush up here to talk to Lynn and Terry. Go buy your books, get in line to get them signed, and talk to them in the back. And uh, if, I, I hope you all join us next week, next Thursday. Um, Melanie Kirkpatrick will be here to talk about her new biography of Sarah Josepha Hale, who was not only the editor of Ladies Godey's book, which we have all the, the copies, her copies here, and her letters with her son, um, but also uh, helped create Thanksgiving as a national holiday. Mary had a little lamb, you name it. Um, the Bunker Hill, Memo Hill Memorial. Um, so it should be a fascinating conversation next Friday night. Bonnie, raise your hand. She, Bonnie, Bonnie Slobodian is the head of Allegro Music Consultants and she helps bring our wonderful chamber music next Friday evening at six o'clock. We have Icarus Percussion Duo here. Uh, another special chamber music uh, event. We still have tickets available. You can buy those online. So we hope to see you at future events I invite you all to join me once again on uh, thanking our special guests, Lynn and Terry, for tonight.